Hello, I'm Alma Angeles and you're watching Eagle News International. Good evening, CJ. Good evening, Alma, and good evening to everyone joining the broadcast. Here are tonight's headlines. Recent Oceanic and... Pagasa, the Wear of the Bureau, officially declared on Friday the onset of La Nina, which is likely to persist until the first quarter of next year. Sydney will scrap all quarantine requirements for travelers from next month. The chief lawyer for ousted Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi said he had been banned by the junta from speaking to journalists, diplomats, or international organizations. Thank you. And a partially shredded canvas of one of Banksy's most celebrated works sold at auction in London for 18.58 million pounds or 25.38 million dollars. First, the Weather Bureau, Pagasa, officially declared today the onset of La Nina, which is likely to persist until the first quarter of next year. Take a look. Recent oceanic and atmospheric conditions indicate La Nina has developed in tropical Pacific. Since July of 2021, the sea surface temperature in the central and equatorial Pacific started to cool and further temperature drop is strengthened in September, reaching La Nina threshold. Based on the latest forecast, La Nina is likely to persist until the first quarter of 2022. La Nina is usually associated with above normal rainfall conditions across most areas of the country during the last quarter of the year and early months of the following year. Rainfall forecast from October 2021 to March 2022 suggests that most parts of the country will likely receive near to above normal rainfall conditions. In addition, four to six tropical cyclones, most of which are landfalling, are expected to develop or enter the Philippine area of responsibility. These tropical cyclones may further enhance the northeast monsoon and could trigger floods, plus floods, landslides, uh, rain-induced landslides over the susceptible areas, particularly in the eastern sections of the country, which normally receive greater amount of rainfall at this time of the year. Adverse impacts are likely over the vulnerable areas and sectors of the country. The country's daily number of recoveries from COVID-19 rose more than double on Friday with the Department of Health reporting 13,363 new recoveries from Thursday Thursday's 5,317. Take a look. Now, in its daily COVID-19 bulletin, the DOH said this brought the overall recovery count to 2,586,369 or 95.6% of a total of 2,750,000. 5,792 confirmed infections in the Philippines. Another 7,625 new cases were also recorded, slightly down from Thursday's 7,835. This brought the number of active cases in the country to 78,999, lower than Thursday's 84,850. The death toll rose to 40,424 with 203 new fatalities. Of these active cases, the majority at 80.6% have exhibited mild symptoms, followed by those with moderate symptoms at 7.38%, the asymptomatic at 6.4%, those with severe symptoms at 3.9%, and 1.7% are in critical condition. Meanwhile, the vaccination of minors aged 15 to 17 begins today with the initial rollout for provinces targeted before the month ends. National Task Force Against COVID-19 Implementer Chief 
and Vaccine Star Secretary Carlito Galvez Jr. on Thursday night said the Department of Health has conducted a simulation after inspecting the eight initial Metro Manila hospitals selected for the pilot. The select hospitals for the pilot pediatric inoculation are the Philippine Children's Medical Center, National Children's Hospital, Philippine Heart Center, Pasig City Children's Hospital, Fe del Mundo Medical Center, Philippine General Hospital, St. Luke's Medical Center in Bonifacio Global City, and Makati Medical Center. Iloilo, Cebu, and some areas in Calabarzon and Central Luzon have asked the task force to be included in the program. The national government would like to assess and complete first the vaccination on the eight sites, but Galvez noted that the rollout in the provinces would begin as early as this month. After the first phase for age 15 to 17, the vaccination will expand to minors age 12 to 14. Tuberculosis is on the rise again globally for the first time in a decade, linked to disruptions in access to health care because of the COVID pandemic. That, according to the World Health Organization's Global TV Program Director, Teresa Caseiva, at a presentation of a report on the infectious disease. More while 66 million lives were saved due uh, to TB prevention and care since the year of 2000, the COVID-19 pandemic has reversed years of progress and efforts in the fight against tuberculosis. For the first time uh, in over a decade, WHO is reporting an increase in tuberculosis deaths. Tuberculosis is the world's second top infectious killer after COVID-19, claiming close to 4,100 lives a day. Both tuberculosis and COVID-19 affect primarily lungs. Although uh, tuberculosis is caused by, by bacteria and COVID-19 by virus. Keep in mind uh, that uh, tuberculosis is everywhere and can affect anyone, though we know that uh, there are a group of high TB burden countries where the risks of getting tuberculosis are much higher. Patients with a TB, uh, in case if they've got uh, COVID-19, will have uh, more severe COVID-19 and in the same time, uh, the risk uh, of uh, less successful treatment for TB is higher. The COVID-19 pandemic has made the situation worse for people with tuberculosis as health funds have been redirected toward tackling coronavirus and people have struggled to access care because of lockdowns. Tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria that most often affects the lungs. Like COVID, it is transmitted by air in, in by infected people, for example, by coughing. Most TB cases occur in just 30 countries, many of them poorer nations in Africa and Asia, and more than half of all new cases are in adult men. Women account for 33% of cases and children 11%. Meantime, Sydney will scrap all quarantine requirements for travelers from next month. That, according to Premier Dominique Perrote of New South Wales, an abrupt step towards reopening Australia's long shuttered borders. But uh, Perrote's suggestion that tourists and students could be weeks away from returning to Australia is promptly slapped down by the country's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, whose government controls borders while quarantine rules are at a state are a state issue take a look probably the most significant announcement we're making uh, is an end to quarantine uh, from 1 november those people returning australians tourists who want to come back who want to visit australia who want to come into sydney uh, hotel quarantine will be a thing of the past those uh, those people coming into australia whether it's a tourist returning australian that you will need to do a pcr test before uh, you board the flight um, and that you will need to show proof of your uh, of that you're double vaccinated so for double vaccinated people right around the world uh, sydney new south wales is open for business we want people back 
We're leading the nation out of this pandemic. A hotel quarantine, home quarantine is a thing of the past. Uh, we are opening Sydney and New South Wales to the world and that date will come in on 1 November. We can lift the caps for returning Australian citizens, residents and their families uh, from the 1st of November into New South Wales. What this also means is that we will be al allowing Australians, um, permanent residents and citizens and their families to leave Australia from wherever they live in Australia and return. But obviously um, the capped arrangements in other states will continue. Uh, we also agreed that we would be looking at expanding the definition of immediate family to include the parents of Australian residents and citizens. And I know that will be very welcome news uh, to Australians right across the country who are hoping to be reunited uh, with their family members, their parents who are overseas. This is about Australian residents and citizens first. The Commonwealth Government has made no decision to allow other visa holders, skilled visa holders, student visa holders, uh, international visitors travelling under an ETA or other uh, international visa arrangement, visa, visiting visa arrangement, to come into Australia under these arrangements. They are decisions for the Commonwealth Government, as the Premier and I know. The U.S. Navy said Thursday that personnel who refuse to be vaccinated against COVID-19 will be expelled from the force ahead of the November 28th deadline for the injection. With COVID-19 vaccines now mandatory for all military members, the Navy has announced plans to start processing for discharge those who refuse vaccination without a pending or approved exemption, it said in a statement. It was the first clear indication by the Pentagon of what would happen to service members who reject the vaccines, which became mandatory at the end of August. Until now, military officials had avoided answering what would happen to those who refused to be vaccinated. The Navy said that 98% of its 350,000 active duty members have begun or completed the vaccination process process. In other news, former U.S. President Bill Clinton was in hospital with an infection, according to a spokesman for the 75-year-old. Doctors said Clinton was responding well at the center in Irvine, California. The infection wasn't connected to the coronavirus. CNN reported that a urinary tract infection had spread to Clinton's bloodstream. The news channel's medical correspondent, Sanjay Gupta, said Clinton had reported feeling fatigued during a visit to California on Tuesday and went to the hospital for testing that ruled out COVID-19 and heart-related problems. Clinton served as America's 42nd president from 1993 to 2001. Elected at age 46, he was the third youngest president in U.S. history and the first baby boomer to hold the office. The annual Balikatan exercises between the Philippines and United States will go full scale next year. That according to Armed Forces of the Philippines Chief General Jose Faustino uh, Jr. on Thursday. He also added that cooperation between the AFP and the United States has improved when it comes to maritime security, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, cybersecurity, and also information sharing among others. Take a look. Both the AFP and the U.S. Armed Forces, uh, we look forward to ongoing close cooperation in areas central to our national and security interests, including counterterrorism, maritime security, cybersecurity, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief, and uh, many others. The alliance uh, is stronger today than it's ever been. Uh, we value uh, the capabilities, capacity, expertise uh, that the Philippine, our Philippine counterparts bring. Even during the previous years, we already have uh, observer countries. Uh, to name a few, we have Japan, we have Australia. And uh, we are uh, looking for, I mean, like we involve, uh, like I said, uh, like-minded countries. We will both look for opportunities to increase uh, the complexity, uh, the scope, uh, all the way to look towards 
new partners participating uh, in the future. Meanwhile, the number of activities and participants during this year's exercises held from April 12 to 23 was killed down in compliance with health and safety protocols. Faustino and uh, Aquilino's meeting resulted in the successful completion of the MDBSEB, ensuring continued robust relations between American and Filipino forces. The U.S. and Philippines agreed to hold over 300 activities for 2021. And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. This portion is brought to you by North Luzon Express Terminal. Abangan! Simula October 18th, lunes hanggang biyernes, alas 8 hanggang alas 10 ng umaga. Mapapanood sa Net25 TV, Facebook page and YouTube channel. Mapapakinggan din sa DZEC 1062 at Eagle FM 95.5. Welcome back. We go back to Norway. Sven Westad, a close friend of two of the victims killed in a bow and arrow attack in the small Norwegian town of Kronsberg this week, says his heart is broken. The day before yesterday, already in the evening, I heard that our good friend living in, in the White House there, she was killed. And now, I haven't dared to be in these streets again until now. And when I walk around here, I see that Hanna, my best friend, she's my best friend around here. She also was killed. I thought she was away on holiday because I had no contact with her. So I still was hoping until I came here that the door was locked and she was away. But now I see that she was among those who were killed. My heart is totally broken. Two of our best friends, two of our best friends was killed, were killed. And maybe more because people were around here, they were killed on the streets and maybe at the marketplace and in the houses. So I still don't know. Now I, I'm completely broken into pieces. I cannot say anything more. It's, it's, I will never get over this. The man who killed five people in a bow and arrow attack in Norway this week has been handed over to health services, according to the prosecution today, fueling doubts about his mental health. Identified as Danish citizen Espen Andersen Breiten, he converted to Islam and is believed to have been radicalized. He has confessed to the killings. A psychiatric evaluation began on Thursday, which was expected 
could take up several months. He has confessed to the killing of five people and injuring three in the southeastern town of Brunsburg using the bow and arrows and other undisclosed weapons before police managed to arrest him. Meanwhile, a judge was to decide later today whether to hold Bratton in detention. Taiwanese residents voiced anguish and outrage on Friday after 46 people perished in an inferno that tore through a dilapidated housing block as investigators searched for what sparked the island's deadliest fire in decades. Take a look. <laughs> The blaze is the latest tragedy to highlight concerns over lax safety standards in Taiwan and has exposed the poor living conditions of many elderly in a society that is rapidly aging. The fire broke out during Thursday's early hours in a 13-story mixed-use building in the southern city of Kaohsiung, raging through multiple floors before firefighters finally got it under control. The rundown housing block was in poor condition, and many of those killed were low-income elderly people, some of whom had disabilities and dementia. Officials said... Oh, 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 Meanwhile, Lebanese President Michel Awun says that he will personally ensure the investigation in the court class will reach the truth behind the heavy fighting, which claimed at least six lives and left dozens wounded in the Lebanon's capital in an escalation of tensions around last year's massive courtside explosion. Take a look. Ahbei, Lisar Ilyaum. راح يكون موضع متابعة أمنية وقضائية وراح أسهر على أنه يوصل التحقيق لحقيقة ما حصل ومحاسبة المسؤولين عنه والمحرضين عليه مثل مثل أي تحقيق قضائي آخر بما فيه التحقيق بجريمة المرفأ يلي كان وراح يبقى من أولويات عملي والتزامي تجاه اللبنانيين والمجتمع الدولي And heavy fighting claimed that these six lives and left dozens wounded in Lebanon's capital Thursday as an escalation of tensions around last year's massive portside explosion turned parts of Beirut into a war zone. The army deployed tanks and troops to quell the street battles that sparked memories of the 1975 to 1990 civil war, for a city already traumatized by last year's blast disaster and Lebanon's worst ever economic crisis. The bloody unrest in which the sound of automatic gunfire and grenade blasts mixed with the wail of ambulance sirens broke out after shots were fired at a demonstration by the Muslim Shiite Hezbollah and Amal movements. The protesters were rallying against the judge Tarek Bitar, tasked with investigating the massive ammonium nitrate explosion at Beirut's port that killed more than 200 people and destroyed swathes of the capital on August 4 last year. The chief lawyer for ousted uh, Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi said Friday he had been banned by the junta from speaking to journalists, diplomats or international organizations. The gag order came after he relayed vivid testimony from the country's deposed president, Win Mint, describing how he rejected a military offer to resign to save himself during the February 1 coup. Kin Mong Zhao had been the sole source of public 
information about Su Chi's court appearances and her well being. My mouth, he said, is under 144, referring to the use of Section 144 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, a British colonial era law normally used to restrict public gatherings and impose curfews. The lawyer will now be barred from talking about those cases to the media, diplomats, international organizations, and foreign governments, he said in a Facebook post. He later posted details of the order. The order said Kim Mong Zhao's communications may cause harassment, hurting a person who is acting in accordance with the law, may cause riots and destabilize the public peace. Su Chi is uh, on trial on a raft of charges ranging from sedition to breaching coronavirus restrictions and faces a long jail term if convicted. But media have been barred from attending court and the Nobel laureate's legal team have been a key source of information on the hearings. Meanwhile, eight countries and the EU diplomatic chief urged the Myanmar junta to let a regional special envoy meet ousted civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi. In a joint statement, the US, Britain, Australia, Canada, South Korea, New Zealand, Norway, and East Timor say they are deeply concerned about the dire situation in Myanmar and urge Naipida to engage constructively with the special envoy. The military authorities have said they will not allow ASEAN special envoy Erwan Yusuf to meet anyone currently on trial, which includes Su Chi. We further call on the military to facilitate regular visits to Myanmar by the ASEAN special envoy and for him to be able to engage freely with all stakeholders according to the statement also endorsed by EU Foreign Affairs Chief Josef Borrell. The last phrase is an apparent refer reference to the junta refusing Yusuf, who is also Brunei's second foreign minister, access to Suu Kyi. Rebuffing pressure from several other ASEAN member states, the Myanmar Foreign Ministry on Thursday insisted Yusuf did not go beyond the permission of existing laws and urged him to focus on meeting government officials instead. ASEAN foreign ministers are set to meet virtually Friday evening to debate whether to exclude Myanmar junta chief Min Aung Lang from an upcoming summit over his government's intransigence. Russian President Vladimir Putin says hundreds of fighters loyal to the Islamic State militant group are congregating in northern Afghanistan with plans to move between ex-Soviet Central Asian countries disguised as refugees. Предложить механизмы долгосрочной стабилизации энергетического рынка, что особенно важно в нынешней непростой ситуации. The Taliban, which seized control of, of uh, Kabul from a pro-Western government in mid-August, are seeking international recognition as well as assistance to avoid a humanitarian disaster. Putin's special envoy to Afghanistan, Amir Kapulov, told Russian news agency Interfax Friday that Taliban representatives would attend an international conference in Moscow next week alongside regional players Iran, China and Pakistan. Putin on Friday said there was no need to rush with official recognition of the Taliban, but noted that they, we understand that we need to interact with them. We'll be back with more stories. Please don't go away. This portion is brought to you by InnoVexel Printing Services. Excellence in innovation. For inquiries, you may call Mark Dimayuga at 0917-900-6396. Gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, 
ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, ang dyan ang MTRCB. Sila ang mga kinikilalang bayaning may mahalagang papel para magkamit ang kalayaan at pagbabago sa Pilipinas. Pero sa panahong ito, may mga bagong bayaning nakikipaglaban sa sakit na lumaganap sa buong daigdig, ang COVID-19. Ang ating mga frontliner, gaya ng healthcare workers, mga doktor, nurses, medical technologists, at iba pang health professionals, mga pulis, sundalo, security guards, mga tauhan na nangangalaga sa seguridad at mahahalagang pangangailangan ng bawat komunidad. Ang mga bagong bayani, ating pasalamatan, kilalani ang kanilang sakripisyo at serbisyo para sa lahat. Hindi ito namumunga at hindi pa lubos na nakikilala. Abay sa larangan ng agrikultura, ito pala ay umaarangkada. Halaman? Oh, hindi ko alam. Hindi ko alam yung kung ano yung... Citronella yung tinanim namin kasi madali hong kumita. Tuloy-tuloy po yung harvest. Nag-try ako dito lang sa paligid ko lang. Ang dami naman nabilihan. Skin care, personal care, home care, drunk care, pet care. Kayang-kaya ng citronella. Mayroon siyang calming ingredients. Nare-relax yung buong katawan mo. Lots of benefit in one product lang. Ako po si Robin Padilla. At ito po ang ulat. Kagapay sa hanap. akong letter sender request on Letters and Music. Ngayong Sabado, 1 to 2 p.m. dito lamang sa NET 25. Hey! Tropical Cyclone o Bagyo ang bagyo ay isang uri ng lagay na panahon na nagdudulot ng malalakas at mabibilis na hangin at pagulan na maaaring maging sanhin ng matitinding pagbaha, daluyong ng dagat at paguho ng lupa. Narito ang mga dapat gawin bago dumating ang bagyo. Una, alamin ang balita ukol sa panahon at mga anunsyong pangkaligtasan. Alamin ang plano ng komunidad sa pagbibigay babala at paglikas. Suriin ang bahay at kumpunihin ang mga mahina at sirang bahagi. Ihanda ang gobag na naglalaman ng mga pangangailangan ng pamilya. Ilikas ang mga alagang hayop sa ligtas na lugar. Kapag inabisuhan ang kinauukulan, mabilis na lumika sa itinaktang evacuation center. Narito naman ang mga dapat gawin habang may bagyo. Una, maging mahinaho, manatili sa loob ng bahay o evacuation center at makinig sa pinakabagong balita at taya ng panahon. 
patayin ang main switch ng kuryente at valve ng tubig. Gumamit ng flashlight o emergency lamp, maging maingat sa paggamit ng kandila o gasera. Umiwas sa mga salaming bintana. Ito naman ang dapat gawin pagkatapos ng bagyo. Hintayin ang abiso ng kinauukulan na ligtas ng bumalik sa tahanan. Umiwas sa mga natumbang puno, nasirang gusali at linya ng kuryente. Huwag gumala upang hindi maabala ang mga emergency services. Siguraduhin walang basa o nakababad na outlet o kagamitan bago buksan ang linya ng kuryente. Itapon ang mga naipong tubig sa lata, paso at gulong upang hindi pamahayan ng lamok. Lalo na kung magagawa ang iba't ibang bagay mula sa mga recyclable material na inaakala ng iba na itatapo na. May ilang barangay sa bansa ang nagre-recycle ng basura at makikita ang iba't ibang bagay na gawa sa basura. sa bahay Sa mga proyektong ito, nagiging malinis ang kapaligiran bukod sa mayroon pang pagkakakitaan. Welcome back. Russian President Vladimir Putin says hundreds of fighters loyal to the Islamic State militant group or ISIS are congregate, congregating in northern Afghanistan with plans to move between ex-Soviet Central Asian countries disguised as refugees. Take a look. Отчетливо видна концентрация вблизи границ содружества экстремистских и террористических группировок. ИГИЛ, Исламское движение Узбекистана, Джамаат, Ансарулах, Аль-Каида и целый ряд других. По нашим данным, количество только ИГИЛовцев на севере Афганистана насчитывает порядка 2000 человек. Их лидеры вынашивают планы по распространению влияния на центральноазиатские государства, на российские регионы своего, своего влияния. Делают ставку на разжигание этноконфессиональных конфликтов и религиозной ненависти. Террористы стремятся проникать на территорию Содружества, в том числе и под видом беженцев. Вместе с тем, объявлено о намерении провести всеобщие выборы. Для независимых государств присоединяюсь к высказываниям сегодня коллегами слова искренне продолжающейся пандемии. Узбекская сторона также высоко оценивает итоги... Туркменистана... The Taliban, which seized control of Kabul from a pro-Western government in mid-August, are seeking international recognition as well as assistance to avoid a humanitarian disaster. Putin's special envoy to Afghanistan, Zamir Kapulov, told Russian news agency Interfax Friday that Taliban representatives would attend an international conference in Moscow next week alongside regional players, Iran, China, and Pakistan. President Putin on Friday said there was no need to rush with official recognition of the Taliban, but noted that, quote, we understand that we need to interact with them.
China's central bank said Friday that the risk of spillover from embattled property giant Evergrande to the financial sector was controllable, breaking its silence on the company's debt troubles, according to state media reports. Concerns are mounting that the cash crunch at Evergrande, which is struggling with more than $300 billion in liabilities could lead to contagion for the wider Chinese economy. Authorities are carrying out risk disposal and resolution work in accordance with the principles of rule of law and marketization. People's Bank of China official Zhu Lan said at a briefing, according to an outlet under the Xinhua State News Agency. Evergrande's liquidity crisis came as the country's property sector found itself under tightened scrutiny after regulators announced caps for three different debt ratios in a scheme dubbed Three Red Lines last year. Fears over China's property sector have intensified in recent weeks after another Chinese developer, Fantasia Holdings, missed payments on debt obligations, while real estate firm Sinek cautioned that it might also see a default. Evergrande's predicament has triggered public anger and rare protests outside the firm's offices in China as investors and suppliers demanded their money back. Meanwhile, at a warehouse northwest of London, dozens of workers sort boxes of holiday toys, scanning barcodes and moving them on forklift trucks. The depot for the entertainer chain of toy shops is getting busier as the festive season approaches, running three shifts of 50 workers every day. But as the holiday nears, the company's chairman, Gary Grant, is concerned about meeting sustained demand as the UK grapples with a supply chain crisis. Take a look. Our challenges are now uh, are releasing containers from the ports. We're struggling with lorry drivers, so we've got a lot of stores, a lot of containers where uh, we're incurring storage charges uh, in the ports. Um, and our main challenges in warehousing now is warehousing labour and lorry drivers deliver the stock from our warehouses to our shops. So we need more warehouse um, workers mm -hmm. and we need more trained HGV drivers. So the challenge for the toy industry is the seasonality of the industry. So we take 50% of our entire year's turnover in just 12 weeks, October through to, to Christmas, um, and obviously 50% in the other nine months. So we're now going into a very, very intense period of very, very high volumes. Uh, and my concern is that Today, early October, our shops are full, we're managing really well, we're shipping on time, we've got great ranges in the shops, and we're ready, keeping up with that demand in stores by having enough warehouse workers and enough um, lorry drivers. I'm just a bit concerned, I think that's going to be a challenge. So Brexit has challenged our business in many ways, um, apart from a shortage of, of workers in the UK, not just for the toy industry, not just for our business, but for, for the wider economy. Uh, we also have 34 stores in Spain. Um, we've had um, quite significant delays in shipping from the UK to Spain, different customs paperwork, different toy safety paperwork to be filled in. It's added complexity, it's added an, an awful lot of cost. A shortage of lorry drivers across the United Kingdom is also a serious problem when thousands of items have to be transported from ports to warehouses, then onto the high street. Britain is short of some 100,000 lorry drivers, which has caused delivery problems across various sectors for weeks now, leading to delays and empty shelves. At the same time, fears about the supply of fuel because of a lack of tanker drivers caused panic buying, long queues at filling stations, as well as frustration and anger. To compound problems, Britain's largest port, the Felix Stowe, has been battling a backlog with container ships full of holiday goods being diverted to the European mainland. Japanese billionaire Yusaku Maizawa said Thursday he felt a great responsibility ahead of his upcoming journey to the International Space Station, or ISS. Take a look. 
でまあ、今回の滞在はおっしゃる通り日本人の民間人としては初めてのステーション滞在ってなることになるんですけれども本当に大きな責任感を感じてますでそこにまあ今回ソユーズに乗っていくわけですけれども、まあ、ステーションにせよそのビークルにせよ本当にいろいろな人の知恵と技術の結集がこのミッションだと思ってますのでそうした全ての関わる皆さんにあの感謝の気持ちを忘れずにあの無事に行って帰ってきたいと思ってます Maezawa 45 is the founder of Japan's largest online fashion mall and the country's 30th richest man, according to Forbes. Maezawa and his assistant are set to blast off from the Russia leased Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan in December, accompanied by Russia cosmonaut Alexander Mizurkin. They are scheduled to spend 12 days on board the ISS, and Maezawa said he plans to document his journey for his YouTube. Channel with over 700,000 subscribers. A partially shredded canvas of one of Banksy's most celebrated works sold at an auction in London for 18.58 million pounds, around 25.38 million US dollars. A new record for the British artist three years after the artwork was bought for a fraction of that price. Take a look. Thank you. Right, the left bank towards me. I can't tell you how terrified I am to bring down this hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking that everyone is accounted for. We know who you all are. <laughs> And selling, ladies and gentlemen, for a new world record, the Banksy. Love is in the bin. Sold to you. 16 million pounds. And moving on. The moment we've all been waiting for.、Um, we have, of course, Banksy's Love is in the Bin. And I'm sure many of you will remember the artwork shredding in this very location three years ago, just seconds after the hammer fell. Now, the artwork, now called Love is in the Bin, sold for nearly 1.1 million pounds at the same Sotheby's location back in October 2018, before it dramatically passed through a shredder hidden. In the large Victorian style frame, moments later. The surreal prank was orchestrated by the elusive and irreverent Banksy, whose identity is said to be known to only a handful of friends and caused a global sensation. Thursday's sale, which saw nine bidders battle for around 10 minutes for the work formerly called Girl with Balloon. Beats the previous record of 16.75 million pounds set for Banksy in March. The seventh lot in a wide ranging contemporary art sale at Sotheby's, it had an estimated selling price of between four to six million pounds. Banksy, Banksy. <laughs> And、uh, that's it for tonight's broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us. It's the weekend. I'm CJ Hero, but the news continues tomorrow. And at the end of the day, there remains so much more to be grateful for. We'll see you back tomorrow at 11. I'm Alma Angeles. And we live, we live in interesting times. times.